what if you and I had all the data that Spotify creates its rap campaigns on and we had a hundred thousand dollars and a couple people helping us that you know, our task was like create the most interesting product you could come away with we would probably like sit overnight with a whiteboard and come away with like 50 ideas and have a really hard time narrowing it down to one that's how many awesome fucking things you could build off of that data alone. I mean, you can have like 1% listeners, chat rooms only, and the artist doesn't even need to be present in there. It could just be like your psychopaths that listen to artists like ad nauseum. You could do all sorts of other things that, you know, we've seen with like token gating and et cetera. So it's really that that we want to liberate. And we want that to basically have a place where if you and I want to create an application in the future, we shouldn't need to start from scratch and have this issue where like, you know, we don't have any users or user activity. We should be able to build on all of that. And if people want to come and expose that data to us with human readable versions of that data to us, um, then we can actually have it. Then we're, we're actually less pressured on getting users and we're more pressured on just having like a really additive good idea. Episode 48 of Invest in Music with Oscillator. Today we're here to talk with RAC and Jack Sploan about their new company for making music data available to the world. As a reminder, you can collect this episode on investinmusic.xyz. I have a very long history with both Dre and Jack, so we got into quite a lot. So without further ado, let's get into it. Episode 48 of Invest in Music with Oscillator. We are back. We have a very special episode today. We got Andre, RAC, and Jack, the founders of Oscillator. What's going on, guys? How are we doing today? Going. Hey, Coop. <laughs> I'm uh, excited to have you guys here. I feel like we have so much that we could cover in the span of an hour. You guys just launched a new project that I want to talk about, but obviously I also want to dive into all the things you guys have been doing in the space over the last couple of years. So before we get in the weeds, why don't you give me a quick background on Oscillator and what it is that you guys announced last week? Uh, where to begin? Uh, Jack, do you want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we'll jump, we'll jump into full context here, but Andre and I have been working together for what, seven or going on eight years now uh, in the crypto space. Uh, and uh, regardless of all the things we've done, we've never actually launched a company together. So uh, regardless of what the company does, that's that's something highlighting on its own. Uh, but the company itself focuses on the intersection of decentralized identity and how a social graph for music, uh, in our hypothesis, will be the next boon for uh, what Web3 and music are known for. Yeah, I mean that's 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 kind of uh, that, that, that's kind of like the gist of it. I think like we've j just to sort of maybe give it some broader context about like how Jack and I like got to this place, basically. Like, uh, and, and it's funny talking to you, Coop, because like you were there for a lot of it, so it feels like kind of like a, a redundant conversation for the for this group because we've like been here, basically. But Let, uh, let's speak in third person about ourselves. Yeah, yeah, like, like, fireside chat. Yes, yeah, you know? so like our, our yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> But but I think I think it's important, you know, to to sort of frame that uh, even you know without going to back to like what's your Bitcoin story, you know, which I feel like every crypto related podcast is always like, where did you discover, you know? Uh, but <laughs> you know, but but Jack and I's journey really starts there, you know, where I, I discovered uh, Ethereum. Really, it was kind of like that light bulb moment for me, like where I, I realized that a lot of music industry. Uh, could be sort of built on like a general purpose blockchain, or at least so I thought, uh, you know, that that was like this core idea. And it turns out that Jack and company at, at, over at Consensus had already been working on this for two years. So I, I was already two years late, but, you know, they were eight years, nine years too early. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but they, they you know, uh, Jack worked on uh, this project called Ujo Music. Um, they released, a, you know, I I guess the first single ever with the image and heap in 2015. And then two years later, first album with me, uh, uh in, in 2017. So, uh, that's the context of the Jack and I met and, and it was always just, you know, Jack worked at consensus, you know, we were fo heavily focused on this, uh, you know, this, this like music on a blockchain kind of problem, I guess, you know, even way before that was such a buzzword. But, uh, you know, so we, we, we kind of went through it all at the same time, you know, in the sense of like the massive boom of 2017, all the excitement around that, all these people coming in and being like ICOs, ICOs, you know, it's the future of investing, whatever, 
all this stuff, music, you know, we're going to put everything on a blockchain <laughs> until, you know, we very quickly realized like, oh, wait, uh, this is uh, this is nowhere near ready for anything, you know, uh, like that. So we kind of we've we've been, you know, ebbing and flowing with it th throughout this whole period. So fast forward to like 2020, um, you know, uh, that's when we started working on on the tape token, uh, which was a. I usually have it as a prop, but it's 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 back there. Basically, it's a, a cassette that's a tape. Prop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's all it is. Um, basically, prop. like a the a cassette tape on a bonding curve, so a physical good on a bonding curve. Uh, you know, which I think reached the peak of uh, uh, what was it like thirteen grand at one point? <laughs> it's just like ridiculous, like early DeFi kind of crazy stuff. So. Uh, you know that 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 was kind of a, the, which actually coincided with Zora v one before Zora was even an NFT platform. So, you know, all these stories are so intermingled. Uh, and you know, Coop, when 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 we met, obviously in 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 the I think a little bit later after that with the RAC token, where we, you know, experimented with uh, you know an ERC twenty token as like a well, social token, I guess, is what we were calling it at the time, or community token, I guess. Um, you know, which kind of predated the NFT boom and, you know, which then I feel like NFTs in a way became the social tokens and things kind of went in that direction, but are now coming back. Anyway, I'm all over the place, but I'm just trying to give you some context of like how Jack and I have been working together on all these different experiments alongside you as well uh, throughout all these years of trial and error, just throwing stuff at the wall, <laughs> seeing what sticks, what what doesn't. And, um, you know, we, we basically kind of landed on this, uh, you know, uh, we, throughout this whole process, we were always like, you know, we have to start a company at some point, you know, what are we doing? Jack worked at a few different companies. I was busy touring and traveling and, 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 and doing stuff. And, and then with COVID and, and all that, uh, very, very busy with that. And, you know, it, it just, our, our lives kind of finally coalesced at one moment, which was really more early last year where we started to talk about it a bit more seriously and started to put a, a, a plan together. So, um, I mean, uh, you know, Jack kind of already gave you the very short abridged version of it, but, you know, basically we're, uh, you know, uh, essentially focused on, uh, you know, in, in in the music vertical, we're focused on on data in between artists and fans. And we felt like that was just like a really interesting thing that a lot of people talk about, but nobody really does. So and what, what I mean by that is like everybody talks about social graphs and and, you know, composability in Web3 and, and music and all that stuff, but, but nobody's doing it. So we're like, OK, well, let's let's focus on that and, and see if we can kind of bridge together th this this ecosystem. So anyway, I threw a lot out you, out at you right now, but I, I just wanted to kind of paint the trajectory of like how we got here, uh, that it wasn't just like one one day where Jack and I was like, hey, let's start a company. You know, it was like mm -hmm. years and years of, of trial and error of trying stuff. And, totally. You know, here, here we are. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think the through line for me there is experimentation, right? I mean, this thing has evolved so much in the last 10 years that how music and crypto intersect with one another is constantly changing. And I feel like you guys have now kind of come to this place where you have a strong thesis on where you think it's going to go into the future. You know, this, you know, call it a manifesto. I don't know if that's the right word to use that you guys put out last week. I think very symbolically represents how you guys think about the intersection of data and music, I'd love to maybe unpack that a little bit more. You know, when you think about Oscillator and what you guys are setting out to build here, how do you think about the opportunity to bring data on chain and what that looks like for you guys as the people to do that? Well, I think, you know, it kind of goes back. There's there's the the story of RAC on chain itself is, I think, the, the perfect case study for Oscillator, kind of in plain sight, right? Um, we did a drop in 2017 of the album. I was obsessed very early on. And the thing that kind of got me into blockchain and music to it in general was royalties can be divided by smart contracts and they can be paid out instantly. Like you don't need to be a computer scientist or a cryptographer or a music industry executive to understand that, that like actually if this technology does what 
I just said, if it can do that, then like, this is clearly going to change the music industry. It's, it's superior technology. So that's what got me into this very early on. That was the kind of reason why we, you know, we're very excited to work with REC at Ujo Music because here we had an artist who uh, we didn't have to like pull teeth to communicate that to, but like actually came to us and wanted to do this thing for an album that they had coming out very soon. And for us, it was like, let's drop everything, release this album on Ethereum, divide payments between the label and Andre and even though you know Andre's in a label deal, we'll treat him like the DSP. And Andre can get the DSP cut. And like we'll we'll waive our fee. There'll be no fee for us. This is a proof of concept. But that was like, wow, artists can create stores. They could take their own DSP rate on top of their own label deals. That's a very innovative thing. Like, so we're getting set up for this. We've got like six weeks to pull it off, we write the smart <laughs> contracts, deploy the site. And we ended up like crushing it and we, we had like a week left where we were doing QA and everything looked good and we were ready to go. And two people on the team were like, what if we actually had a token that rather than just the transaction that proved purchase, there was a token that went to anyone who bought it too. And that was just a proof of patronage. Um, very simple idea, idea pre ERC 721. So NFTs effectively did not exist yet. Um, the term NFT was the non-existent. No one had ever said that before. And we used ERC-20 tokens to issue basically a receipt um, or what uh, Simon of the Rouvier called on the Ujo team, proof of patronage. Um, and for us, that was like, okay, yeah, like this, this is something that we could do and maybe we could build on, you know, the idea of composability, et cetera. People can take this with them. They could use it in other places, authenticate themselves to do different things. That's interesting. Um, and so on and so forth. And I would say that was like the beginning of the end of me being very excited about <laughs> smart contracts for royalties, because it all of a sudden was like, sure, that can happen. And I still think that will happen to this day. Um, but over a series of events that happened over the next three years, working at consensus, working with the, the incumbent music industry, uh, I came very, very disenfranchised from trying to work with music copyright. Um, there's statute that necessitates how it gets paid. You can have better technology than all of the performing rights organizations. Uh, it doesn't matter. Money still needs to go through them. So for me, it was like I got left holding this bag of like, here I am, this blockchain music guy. And uh, I need to speak about its actual defensible properties. And that was like, OK, yeah, we have like, you know, the the idea of composability and users moving around the web with their data points. That's that's great. But like. That's a byproduct of people doing things in this space. So what kind of cool things can we do? Um, and then inherently still revolved around things like price discovery. So that's why we chose to do tape. Uh, but after we did tape, COVID happened. Um, or I guess tape, yeah, tape happened maybe right inside the middle of COVID, but uh, right in the beginning. But like very quickly into COVID, we were dealing with a different world. Um, Andre was live streaming on Twitch, like what seemed like every single day. Um, if it wasn't, it, it sure Too as much. hell like Too much. seemed like it. Um, had a very budding discord. Uh, there was a lot of people online, right? There was a lot of people online supporting Andre in very different ways and some in unique new ways because of COVID. And all of a sudden, like that created this like sandbox for us to actually experiment with this idea of what actual kind of ways can we deplatformize these audiences from where they are respectively, Twitch, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, Spotify, et cetera. Um, and actually bring them into a platform that we have control over and we don't have attrition over. Because I can talk to you all day about royalties and how they could be better and how artists don't get paid enough. Um, but one thing that like really actually is a real problem that like an artist will tell you is platform dependency. And this is something that is like so omnipresent across all media verticals. Artists will tell you building audiences on platforms is is getting old and tiresome when these platforms either like course correct into their own direction for their own uh, motivations, or they go down and you lose those relationships. Um, you also lose like the proof points that there even words an audience there. And that that's a shame, right? Um, I can relate to that as a fan. Um, I was a very avid SoundCloud user. Um, was very proud of what I did on SoundCloud. None of it really matters anymore. I, I go back to MySpace and things I did on MySpace. Like I'd love to show artists that I had them as my MySpace song. Um, or at least maybe have some sort of proof of record of that. So fast forward to now and, and you know, what's happened over the past four years since, since really that began, um, 
we, we looked at everything we've done and, and it was always actually about an audience and trying to understand an audience and aggregate an audience based on many, many different types of behaviors that happened over many different types of places. So combine that with some of the things happening within crypto around identity and the properties around how crypto can actually solve for different identity structures and application structures on the web. It seems like this might actually be one of the more defensible areas uh, within decentralization that we can build within that if we had to bet on it would, would actually start actually changing the music industry. Um, maybe that's because we're a little bit traumatized from trying to touch catalog um, partly, but for the most part, um, I'll go out and say that like, I think the actual data that denominates artist fan relationships in itself is an asset class that the incumbent music industry has no idea about yet. So that's really the area that we want to occupy. And, and it, it's like, it, you know, we, after sort of hitting our head against the wall so for so many years, I, I think we, we also wanted to focus on something that we knew that couldn't be sort of rugged or, or taken away from us, mm. you know? So, uh, you know that 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 was kind of the the motivation there of just you know uh i mean soundcloud is a is a great example where at one point in time was one of my i had one of the biggest accounts on there and you know obviously listening listener behavior moved to spotify and 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 whatnot and and uh you know none of that information sort of transferred al alongside that and 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 it makes sense in the context of web two because nobody has that expectation. Right. But I, I feel like if we're going to be building a better, you know, if, if, if we're going to show what web three could really do, I think we should lean into the things that make that are interesting and that are unique to it, that make it, that are better than the, the prior system, you know, um, composability being one that I think is, is pretty key. A lot of people talk about it. Uh, but um, in music, I feel like it's been a little bit ignored. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's getting better, but like I think it's something that we should be focusing on. So, for example, like uh, you know, I talk a lot about like DeFi Summer. For those who don't know what it, what it was, it was sort of this little pocket of time where it, it was just so cool because it was the first time where you, you started to use your wallet as sort of your identity online. You know, where you connect your wallet on one platform. And and the platforms, or I should say, no, they're not platforms. The the you know the UI, which is really all it is, sort of a UI transforms to change depending on what's in your wallet. You know, like a Zero. You, wanted, you wanted to say DAP, didn't you? You were going to no, say no, DAP. No, I'm not saying DAP. I, I refuse to use that word. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but you, you get my point. It's sort of like when you connect your wallet in different places, you it, it's it, the UI became becomes another layer. A sort of interpreting the data that's already there, just interpreting your data on chain, like that is really interesting and really novel. And and being able to sort of share information between all of those different apps, I think that's really interesting, you know. And and I would love to see that happening for music. And I I, I, I get we talk about this a lot with with the, specifically the music vertical, is that it, it just feels like there's such a it's so small right now. Hmm. that we have an opportunity now to shape it, you know, to have like real impact so that, you know, when it grows to something much bigger, that it, it it's built on the right principles and, and, and all that. So that's, I mean, we're talking about like a lot of different things, but those are some of the motivations that sort of, you know, really we're trying to, you know, focus on. I find it really fascinating because you're a very unique case that you've been on chain for a long time. You've had success trading tokens, being active in DeFi summer, doing LPing, doing these crazy things that most people in crypto are, you know, like really knowledgeable on. But then you've also had success being an artist on chain and having one of the biggest sales ever on Super Air, you know, having drops that have grossed, you know, crazy amounts of ETH on the back of it. And I find it very fascinating that despite all of these experiments you've run from dropping digital art, to putting out a social token to you know, putting one of the first songs ever on chain that now you've kind of come full circle to data being the key focal point here. And I'd love to hear more about how you view this kind of constant money craze that happens with crypto versus the more tangible and practical application of like putting data on chain and how you thought about that with relation to starting this company. Well, yeah, it, it's true. Cause like m money is sort of like the growth pack or whatever you want to call it. The crypto has, it's sort of like it attracts 
a lot of people, maybe not the best people, but like it does attract people. Um, and, and I always felt like, you know, cause like my, again, my initial motivations were like, oh, we'll rebuild the plumbing. You know, it's not, a, it's not really about fu- the financial side, even though that's interesting, you know, let's, let's rebuild the plumbing. So my idea was like, okay, like if, if the money brings in the people, why would they stay? They stay because it's a better system, you know, it's a more equitable system. It's a better system for artists. And, um, you know, so, so that, that was kind of like, I, I, I sort of take it, uh, you know, I, I don't love the obsession with, with money on it, but I realize that it's, it's a, a means to an end, I guess that it's, it's one thing that, you know, is in all of our natures <laughs> to, to, you know, we, we all got kind of wrapped up in it and, um, and it's, it's an kind of an inherent part of, of this ecosystem. You know, it's actually interesting because when we were first coming up with the ideas, we had a, we had a friend of ours, um, that, uh, said something like, it was basically saying is like, lean into it, you know, lean into the speculation, lean into that. And, and we, we had a kind of an on a real honest conversation about it. And we were like, should we, should we do that? I mean, that is kind of what works, you know? And we actually really decided not to, because we kind of felt like, you know, uh, at some point in time, this is just going to become like a base layer. People won't even know they're interacting with crypto. It's like just kind of this, you know, programmatic thing that happens behind the scenes. And, and that's like ultimately what is going to create a lot of the changes that people talk about with blockchains and whatever, you know, it's mm. not, um, I don't think the average user is going to care, um, nor maybe should they. So, you know, that, that's, that, that's kind of how I see it. So we're, we're, what we're trying to do, I think is be a positive force, specifically in the music side, because that's what we know and, and help sort of bring together this relatively small, cottage industry and sort of help it grow, you know, uh, you know, connective, you know, like be connective tissue amongst a a lot of different platforms. And, um, I know this all sounds kind of vague, but, (laughs) but like that, that's our, our, our mission to go to bring it back to what you're asking about, like the website and the manifesto and all that. It's like, we are building specific products, um, you know, which are not out yet, but we did sort of want to announce our intention and Mm -hmm. our goals as lofty and crazy as they could be first, because we want to attract the people that believe in that, you know, um, that we, we want those people to, to sign the manifesto and join us as, as like, uh, you know, simplistic as that sounds, you know, that, that was, that was kind of the goal. It's like, let's, let's sort of put our ambition and aspiration out on the table and figure out kind of together collectively how to get there, you know, because I think a lot of people see that future, but don't really know how to get there. And not saying we know every right decision, but you know, like it's an, it's an intent, you know, it's like, we want, we want to, we want to get there. Totally. Yeah. And I think Jack, it's one of the things I've always respected about you is you've been so committed to putting things on chain in a very commendable way that the rest of the world will come to respect, you know, and I guess turning that into a question, how have you thought about navigating um, this world where crypto is so tied to speculation versus what I've always found to be your main focus and attention, which is really figuring out what does a better system look like for data management on chain for rights management for copyright? How did that kind of come into this project while you've had to juggle the expectation that people have with crypto, which is for all intents and purposes, trying to make money off gambling random internet coins. Um, yeah, so you're going to make me comment on the DGENs. Um, <laughs> I, I got to say, it, it's becoming increasingly expensive for me to not be a DGEN myself, given the knowledge I've accumulated. Um, so, so there's my personal position on DGENs. And I, I separate the whole you know, field that we work in. Uh, if I ran into these people at parties, DGENs are actually some people that I, I identify with the most. Um, although I, I'm not a gambler or a, uh, a, a DGEN necessarily per se in crypto. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I think that there's definitely a, a strong bifurcation about when you came into crypto, it, it indicating why you came into crypto. Um, there's not really very many people that came in pre-2017 ICO booms. Um, that are like big degen traders. 
um, with the exception of people that made a lot of money during that cycle and then participated in DGEN games because that's inherently what they are. Um, it's not necessarily their identity. Um, there's definitely a, a, a lot of them, but I don't think a lot of the people that have stuck around and are continued to be building um, really uh, kind of match that DNA. Um, so strong association. Um, when I tell people that I work in crypto, that they think I'm among uh, that cohort of people or person. Um, but, you know, this was always about trying to find a better system and actually do something that was um, sustainable and actually had an impact. Um, I, I, God, I, I, I'm listening to myself. It sounds incredibly corny, uh, <laughs> especially in the face of the first thing I said where I'm leaving money on the table. But um, this is not about, you know, casino games. It never was. Uh, but for the very reason that it's actually incredibly exploitable by just about anybody and you can actually have payment rails that can do just about anything. It inherently it makes really really strong technology for doing good things too. Mm. Um, in in the same way that like you know democracy is a double edged sword, um, crypto is very much a double edged sword. So it's definitely been a test of patience, um, that's for sure. But um, I've learned to have a lot of fun with it. I think like in 2017 there were some like real strong moments where uh, me and like many other people at, at consensus were like we need to like write and we need to talk about the issues happening within greed and crypto. Um, but you kind of get used to it. And I, I actually am like kind of tired of like the crypto is just this or just that arguments. It's like, I don't know, don't like don't mid curve it. Like, yeah, there's a bunch of like, really undesirable behaviors everywhere in the world. Um, and this is inherently financialized. So you're going to get the best of that. Um, I will say though, just listening to Andre, like, as far as musicians go, like chasing money was like kind of taboo up until, I don't know, like TikTok. I don't really actually know when it changed, but like maybe COVID, COVID. and like Wall Street, Wall Street bets. Yeah. Like GameStop shit. But like uh, making money was never cool. It Like it actually was like very not cool. It's uh, like, oh, you even, sold like, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even like being financially savvy was like pretty uncool. So like I'll, I'll speak to like, there's still a very strong um, friction between like music cultures and crypto cultures. And like that, I don't think is something that can be ignored or like, you can just learn to like get over that. Um, I think that like that, those will have to be reconciled. And I think it will be through like trying to create actual things that, that don't bring the kind of more degenerate culture with it. Um, but at the same time, like the phenomenon of the crypto degen culture is a culture in itself that, you know, it comes with good and bad. Um, so uh, I guess the answer is still to be seen. Like, you know, how do we balance, you know, building for the DGENs versus, you know, building for things that have existed long before that? Um, and I, I do, I think, increasingly believe that it, it kind of has to be both. Um, Kayvon from uh, Foundation wrote a piece in 2020 or 2021 called Crypto Wants to be Seen. It's something that I, I, I cite quite often and I share it with anyone who wants to read it. But they talk about the trade-offs they had to make in designing products with like really clunky UX, aka like wallets and crypto tools uh, that were that were uh, sorry, crypto tools that were non-custodial in nature, uh, such as like MetaMask, uh, versus offering like instantiated wallets where uh, users were not exposed to things like uh, you know, seed phrases and things like that. And they ultimately end up ripping out the more kind of web 2.5 versions of their product because it caused all these breaking changes. You lose composability, you lose all these properties that come with this hard technology. Um, so it's still quite a mess right now. And a lot of um, the things that come with the DGEN culture are going to have to be adopted by mainstream, I think, um, in order to have the kind of hard properties that we, we benefit from in crypto. Uh, but at the same time, like, how financialized is the future? Um, I'm not really sure, but I think that uh, I think there is a place for it. And as long as we don't like, you know, really sell out, um, we're doing fine. <laughs> yeah. And I think for me too, it's very symbolic of the wider movement happening within crypto right now, or at least the big focus of mine is how do you build products that are accessible to the real world? You know, I think historically speaking, people have jumped through hoops because they want to make money. And I think that's been largely the only reason why people come into crypto is they see an opportunity to, you know, make money for themselves in a way that feels autonomous, that feels separate from the current system. And they stick around because they find that there's great people here. But I'd say for all intents and purposes, 
most people that are getting into crypto are viewing it as a financial investment. And I think what we're seeing now in the last six to 12 months is that there's a growing demographic of founders and builders who are saying, okay, maybe there are things to do with crypto here that aren't only about making money. Maybe there are actual true merits to building social graphs on chain to composability. And I think what I get from what you guys are building is this intention of saying, hey, let's focus on the things outside of making money on chain and let's show that those things can be valuable. And so I guess turning that into a question, I'd love to hear like, what does that look like for you guys when you think about bringing music data on chain and some of the opportunities that that unlocks for fans and artists at large? Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because like, uh, again, I, like Jack mentioned, I, I feel like I'm kind of a unique place where I, I have, you know, a pretty long history of like on-chain data already there to play with that is, you know, anybody can use it, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, it's perhaps a bit complicated to make sense of just for the average user, of course, but uh, even for us, you know, <laughs> take some digging to kind of make sense of it. But but the the, the thought is, you know, this is, um, you know, the, the, here's like sort of a, like a case study, basically. Let's show what this could do. And, and sort of, I think by showing that other artists could perhaps see the value in, in creating that there's something permanent about it. You know, there's something, mm -hmm. there, there's this kind of thing that, uh, that feels long-term, especially if you've been around for a while, like, you know, we're going back to 2017, like, you know, it, it's just like a very different, very different time in the world and everything. And like, just being able to see like, what's, what's there, um, y y you know, it's, it's sort of the snapshot and, uh, and, you know, I, I often think like, what does this look like in 20 years? You know, uh, that's really interesting to look back at that probably like seemingly very primitive data, you know? So anyway, the, the, I, I do want to make sort of a differentiation, which is like, you know, as we sort of think about this, uh, like, I, I think we have a lot of aspirations to sort of, let, let's call it, on, you know, put it on chain or, or, uh, but I think like what, what we really want is to make it accessible. You know, the, the specifics of what L2 or whatever version of this works, uh, we don't know yet. Like, I think it'd be kind of like naive to say that we have all that figured out and it'd probably even serve us to like wait on that, you know, until the technology matures a bit. But like, I think we, we want that data to be, to be portable and to be accessible uh, openly. You know that's that's already a leg up on everything else. So uh, you know if if we can start there, like imagine the applications that could be built on that. You know, um, you know th there's uh, th th there's 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 so many things that so could sort of like that you know that we this is sort of like a, a theme that I've noticed all, all, all over the years. You know, it's like if if you build open infrastructure, people will build apps on it, and especially. In, in crypto, I think the reason why it's been successful and whether you, you know, you can say it's for financial reasons or not, but like, you know, it's arguably this um, amazing feat of like open source software, you know, um, you know, the, the world runs on Linux, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't think most people maybe even realize that. So it, it's like o open source is here to stay. It's tried and true. We're not reinventing the wheel. Like we, we can see the value of creating open systems. Um, and, uh, you, you know, we, we, like basically applying that to music, which has never had that, that's kind of one of the unfortunate sides of, of, of the music infrastructure that exists right now is that there's still stuff that's done on pen and paper. Like it's, it blows my mind. Like this is <laughs> 2024. Like, what are we doing? You know, it's all these like scattered systems. Nobody talks to each other, even, uh, you know, DSPs, you know, having to digital distributors exist because, there's so many outlets to upload to, you know? So you're literally uploading to an FT. Anyway, I won't get into the details, but like, it's, it's just this very archaic broken system at this point. I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You guys already know this, but it, it's, it's sort of like, I think we have an opportunity to create, you know, an open infrastructure that could be built upon. And, and that's the exciting future that I think we all want to see and is really only possible with crypto. So like, the choice is made for us. This is the only thing, the only way to do it, you know? Hmm. Anything you're not on there, Jack? Yeah. Let, let me describe that in like crystal clear detail. Like 
blockchains are good for a lot of things. For our context with Oscillator, forget Oscillator. Like, what are they good for with music right now? They're giving everybody basically a a key manager where they can cryptographically sign data, and they can keep those hashes where on a blockchain. Okay, like for nothing else, what is the val like what is the value of that in the context of music consumption? Well, as a fan, there's a ton of data that I create just either deliberately or passively listening to music. Um, you know, whether it's like, you know, following an artist on Spotify or listening to a playlist um, that I don't even choose the music from, there's data happening. There's a data trail. I'm interacting with songs, I'm interacting with artists. I heavily, you know, archived music on SoundCloud and um, like ad nauseum would go into other people's likes and like look at songs that they like to go down little crumb trails there. Um, there's a ton of data uh, and all of it lives within their own respective servers of these companies. That's a shame. Um, so what if we could actually taking identity that could be authenticated via a wallet or a key manager program, which we're now all going to have in this near future, and we could hash data when we do it. So whether or not data belongs on chain or not, let alone as an asset on chain, I'm not really sure. Um, but I will tell you right now, like music NFTs with songs as an asset on chain, that makes sense. I have a worldview that that is actually compatible with. But what about all the data in between? What about how I found the song or the person I followed to like that song or the like of that song? These are all behavioral events that are not necessarily captured on chain. And if you want to talk about like valuable block space or not, and whether or not it does, I don't know if it does, but I know that we can at least authenticate that data and verify that data on chain and make it portable and accessible other places. So mm -hmm. long as it's feasible. So that brings us to feasibility. What's actually going to make this feasible where we can have a shared social graph, shared social graph for music that we can build on in 10 years. Well, we need coordination. And that's, that's a large bit of the inspiration for Oscillator is actually creating the coordination mechanism for bringing this data into standard identifiers in a way that can be indexed and interpreted long after all of us are gone so that this data is actually rich and meaningful in context. Um, so, you know, we we're talking a little bit about decentralized storage before we hit record. Things like Rweave, IPFS can be places where data can live, but the data can live client side. All that's important is that you can actually verify it via some mechanism and through actually having ways of doing so on chain at the event of them occurring, you can then bring that into the future. So we've got a bunch of converging factors that are actually making this much more accessible. Things like account abstraction, low transaction costs because of L2s are now actually putting this in the limelight. So our bet is that this next cycle is actually going to be the thing that actually makes this possible now. You guys use the word accessibility a lot. I'm curious, what do you think that looks like at scale? Obviously, I know in the year 2024, it means one thing versus what this is going to look like in the future. But describe this world of open and accessible music data and who's accessing that and what they're able to do with that in like a very utopian sense of the word. Coop, what if you and I had all the data that Spotify creates its wrapped campaigns on and we had hundred thousand dollars and a couple people helping us that and our task was like create the most interesting product you could come away with we would probably like sit overnight with a whiteboard and come away with like 50 ideas and have a really hard time narrowing it down to one mm -hmm. that's how many awesome fucking things you could build off of that data alone i mean you could have like one percent listeners chat rooms only and the artist doesn't even need to be present in there it could just be like your psychopaths that listen to artists um, like ad nauseum, mm -hmm. you could do all sorts of other things that, you know, we've seen with like token gating and et cetera. So um, it's really like that, that we want to liberate. And we want that to basically have a place where if you and I want to create an application in the future, we shouldn't need to start from scratch and have this issue where like, you know, we don't have any users or user activity. We should be able to build on all of that. And if people want to come and expose that data to us with human readable versions of that data to us, um, then we can actually have it. Then we're we're actually less pressured on getting users and we're more pressured on just having like a really additive good idea, which is what we actually want to start see winning. Um, so with music, music is the asset class. We think in the future, the actual data will be an equal, if not greater asset class. We just want to make sure that it belongs to the right people. Mm. And that's artists and fans. 
Yeah, because um, naturally, as you know, in the past, you know, fifteen years, it's belonged to platforms, and they've monetized it, and you know, that's and that's uh, that's their game. That's what they're playing. You know, um, y- your uh, you know, these apps aren't free. You know what I mean? People always say they're free. They're not. You're paying for it with your own data. So you know, we we just we just feel that that should be in the in the hands of artists. You know, and in in control. Of the artists, so th- there's another example that I, I want to throw out is, um, you know, w- if you have, you know, all this, uh, e- even if it is musical assets, you know, if, uh, music NFTs, whatever, uh, if even if you have that all on chain, wouldn't it be cool to sort of have multiple players, you know, compete on just the playback experience? You know what I mean? Uh, as opposed to just like being these singular canonical things, you know. I, I I just feel I would love to use an alternate Spotify client or whatever. You know, there, there's so many other like there's so many doors that open if if you have this this layer be be sort of open to to anybody. So that just feels like a cooler future to me. You know, than than trying to um, you know force one singular version of it down everybody's throat. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and and unfortunately, I just don't think this is going to happen with with the current sort of music industry uh they're they're too uh, you know it's 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 too ossified it's it's just the way it's going to be so um you know that that's why we're kind of tackling this issue head on because it's something that they don't control essentially um and we feel like we can have be, be the most effective in that area while still you know building towards uh you know, th- there's a lot of other people working on minting and on chain music and all that stuff. So it's, so we want to be complementary to it. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a very novel approach. And I would say plus one to the things you can do with open and accessible music data. I mean, I think the chat room that you mentioned where top 0.01% fans can hang out together is really valuable to me. Somewhere that my mind goes is data is the underpinning of the economics of the music industry. You know, when I talk to my friends who are running labels and they're looking at which songs are getting the money, most videos created of it on TikTok? How is that driving consumption on Spotify? It really is just the data game at the end of the day. And I think that we all love to recognize the creative value that music offers to the world. But when you look at the financial underpinning of the music industry, it's a lot more driven by the tangible data infrastructure that is only available to a very select few parties, much more than it is by you know, the creative and emotional resonance that it might have on more of an esoteric level. So I think for mm-hmm. me, being able to make music data accessible is equally about the experiences you can create for artists and fans and the relationships they have with one another. But I think it's also about democratizing the economic opportunities that exist for curators and tastemakers and people who want to be able to basically make a living on the back of their music taste, where now they're actually able to compete in a similar way to a major label that has private API access to Spotify. Where right now, when you go and try and see who are RAC's listeners on Spotify, you can't pull that. If you want to see who are your top 1% fans, you can't pull that. If I want to see how many streams have you gotten on Passion in the last year, what are your daily streams per day, you can't pull that. And I think right now these systems are very much closed off in the sense that if you want to be making informed, analytical business decisions about music, you need to have a proprietary relationship with that third party. And if I had to extrapolate Mm -hmm. where I see what you guys are being, being valuable is, is that in the future... You shouldn't have to need to get permission from a platform to be able to make informed economic decisions about how music is valued. Mm -hmm. Especially as it relates to you or your business, especially that case. So like, this is our first version of streaming. Okay. Like we, you know, we've spent the past 20 years nailing down how we, you know, license music globally into one place so that a search bar can literally query it. That's, that's the innovation of Spotify. Mm -hmm. um is just digital consumption of music complete with royalties paid okay um great now that we've done this where are the holes and Mm -hmm. how could this be better um yeah there's the whole royalty thing there's you know music is is not paid for enough sure um you know and there's actually completely different philosophies on that some people think it should be accessible and open and free um music itself and then and then there's those that think that, you know, there's there's not a price high enough to pay for it and, and there should be as much friction as possible. Um, but there's no leverage there. Mm. There's no leverage. We have zero leverage to innovate there. 
If you look at the past 20 years and look at anybody who's actually tried to build a meaningful music consumption, a music distribution service, they've inherently either died or fallen into the incumbent's hands because the incumbents use actual law statute to inform how their catalog, their asset class is played with against the motivations of the individual artists who that's merely one of their products of their business. So it's kind of all happened in the wrong order where the leverage has fallen into the wrong hands. And the idea of oscillator is really, we think this data is valuable. We also think that it's not really like abundantly obvious how valuable it actually will be if it's aggregated. And we think that is actually a new asset class so long as there's actually someone focusing on structuring it in that way. So the opportunity right now is actually coordinating between this cottage industry of music web three startups who, you know, have all taken their own hand and doing different things, most mostly with music distribution or, you know, communities and in communities around artists themselves. And if we actually start to work on like open standards, we actually are going to be the ones that create the kind of new scaffolding mm -hmm. for what the music and really I, I wouldn't call it the music business. Um, but artist fan kind of relationships and how they exist and how mm -hmm. they exist in perpetuity. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I keep hitting that part there, but like, I, I was going to, I was yeah. going to say, we, we had this, uh, we had this meme that we, we use a lot, whereas, uh, it's, you know, the, the one, the astronauts, uh, where it's oh, like, yeah. so I already know uh, what you're talking about with Jack. Yeah, the, the meme was just and... like, what, what do you mean? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's about artists and fan relationships. It, it always has been or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, but that, that was such a, uh, a turning point for us because we realized that like the, the music industry as itself is really just a function of the artists and fan relationship. They're just in the way. And they serve a function in the sense of like monetizing, you know, the, that relationship, but they are just one way to monetize that relationship. They're, and, they're artist fan brokers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so we, we just feel like there's a lot of other ways to connect people, um, that are maybe tangential or, you know, maybe uh, parallel to, to music in that sense, you know, that they're not even touching music as an asset but are, you know, establishing that connection. And, and that, uh, we're not even prescriptive about that, you know, <laughs> it, it, it could take all kinds of different forms, you know, uh, and, and we kind of want to leave that up to the artist uh, and sort of develop that over time. But, you know, it, it's, it's not. Um... So, so, so Coop, imagine a future where as an artist, you have a dashboard where you can go and see all this data that's relevant created to you, where it's created, et cetera. And you see there's like an entire, ecosystem of applications that um, all have their own respective categories with respect to what they do. Some can be chat rooms, some, some can be listening experiences, some can be multimedia experiences, others can be like feeds and, you know, stuff like that. Um, you should have the ability to like whitelist and blacklist where your own data gets used because you should also have the ability to have revenue share from that when it's used. So imagine kind of like a network where as an application facilitating the creation of artist fan related data, you are potentially being compensated for um, actually sharing that information to this protocol. And then in the future, if you want to consume information, you can either like use your credits to do that or you can pay for it. But there you have the economy and then you actually have rev share returning to the actual people creating the data itself. Um, ideally, in that world, we're now sitting on technology that's strong enough where the owners are rather kind of cooperative in nature and they're the artists themselves. Hmm. It's, a, it's taking a, a step out for a second, but I've been feeling really stressed about the way that music industry lawyers view the emergence of new technology. I know that's like a very big <laughs> statement, but one thing that I've been really running into in just my day-to-day -day life is every time that there's an introduction of a new way to monetize music, there's a new way to invest in music, there's a new way to aggregate artist fan relationships. It feels like the legal layer that sits on top of music is so protective from the years and years and years of artists being taken advantage of that it's very difficult to see what that change tangibly looks like. You know, I think one thing that's really interesting for you guys is the vision of what you're painting to me could not be more clear and could not be more accurate and valuable. I guess the question that I would have, and just it's a, it's a very high level question, I don't expect you have a tangible answer, is like, what do you think the path to get there looks like? You know, knowing that this industry is weighed down by so many years of 
precedent and incumbents and such a resistance to change. How do you think we get to a world where there is an actual open, accessible data standard for music? I, I have this, I have this like uh, anecdote. I remember like when, you know, I mean, you guys were, were there, but like when NFTs really started to take off, um, everybody here was suddenly an, you know, like suddenly viewed as an expert in the space, even though we had been, you know, we had just been a, maybe here a few months prior, you know, uh, and I, I remember having a call with a lawyer, uh, and they they just start to started to go into it's like well you know we'll split this with the label and split this with the publisher and I'm like what are you talking about there's <laughs> there's, there's nothing there's no I I, I got like from from publishers no like like we all know and respect they'd be like so let us know how you want to send over the smart contract <laughs> as if it's like a docu sign <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and I've gotten it multiple times. And and it's kind of like it was like well how how, do, how are we going to split this? It's like why are we splitting this? Mm. What claim do you have over this? You know, this is not your domain. You know, and you know people. I, I'd say at this point there started to be like a little bit of like a push for that of like you know I mean look I I get it I, I can sense like you know I can see the label side too like if you invested money in an artist and and they're benefiting from the work that you and the money that you put into it I don't think it's unfair to to expect to be compensated for that that's how the business works but if you're a free and clear artist like you know what I mean like yeah <laughs> why <laughs> you know anyway but but that's like that that's their pr perspective many times it's like where's my cut you know mm. and it's kind of like what do you what do you mean you know like where where we're going you don't exist <laughs> you know uh i mean i'm not being that harsh about it like you know i i i, I i've always thought of like certain aspects of the music industry as practical and, and reasonable and and you know th there are a lot of great good actors in the space it's not like sometimes people paint it as this overly negative thing um but <laughs> i i don't know i i think like uh like that, that's again, reason 450, why we decided to not touch catalog because, because of that, because of yeah. lawyers. And, and that's I, why we're, we're focused on this other thing where they can't touch it. Basically. It's mm. very complimentary and, and new yeah. what we're doing and how we're doing it. I should say like, uh, we're not, we're not competing with the CRM system you use to be like explicitly clear. This is not a CRM thing. Can CRM be built off the back of this in the future? Like far future at maturity? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. But like, this is not meant to replace or cannibalize your existing CRM. Um, you also like, you know, if you're not doing things on chain already, then like you're, you're probably not really going to be in our product market fit. And if you are doing things on chain, then this should resonate with you and you should, you should be very interested in this. Um, it's also supposed to be, you know, in addition to being complimentary, um, like kind of horizontal and ubiquitously supportive, uh, as you can imagine, of the platforms themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you are a platform building within the space and you have, you know, wallet based activity, I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, you are a candidate for someone that should should be contributing to and benefiting from using the OSC protocol in the future. So th this is all, you know, quite forward looking and, and um, uh, a little bit more ambition speak, if you will. But, um, you know, if things go the way we are currently imagining and envisioning and, and we dream they would, um, it's it's a matter of sequencing to answer your question, like specifically. It's a matter of actually lining up and coordinating the current industry that has emerged within within this crypto space focused on music in a way to actually do something that if we all collaborate on, then the sum is truly much greater than the parts. Right. Um, you know, like releasing a music as an NFT is like definitely new and it's a new way of doing something, but like you're still just selling music. Mm -hmm. Getting a bunch of companies to coordinate on data that they are actually creating around standard identifiers for fans and standard identifiers for artists and the actual behaviors that we've all done many times over many applications, just like, listen, follow, etc. cetera. Um, then it actually becomes like you're either in this or using this or you're not. And there's not really much you can do to stop it now. Mm. Um, and that, that to us seems like it has a very kind of clear exit trajectory. Must be called an expert. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's very, it's very, it's just funny. It's just very, you know, resonant of like the time that we lived in where you would get on yeah. like any interview or Zoom call or Twitter or something and be like, we are joined by a cryptocurrency expert. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm like, oh, we're in the bull market, baby. We're back. The term expert thing thrown around out here. Yeah. But I mean, like everything you're saying is so, it just reminds me so much of like the emotional place that the music industry seems to operate from, which is a very closed extractive protective like don't touch my things i won't touch yours like if you want to touch this thing like you better be careful you better pay us type thing and i really just resonate with what you said jack about starting from data that is currently on chain because it's built with a fundamentally different nature in mind and i think that once people start to experience open accessible platforms open data what you can do with that the philosophy about how things are built is much different from what exists in the past and I'm really just optimistic that we can make those benefits and those advantages tangible and clear enough where we don't end up in a world where the next generation of music products are all built in the same silos that they are today because a lot of what's hindered innovation. And I think a lot of the reason why people say that music is such a bad asset class and a bad place to build a career is because there's an inability for this asset class to be valuable by virtue of the way that we treat it and by the virtue of the way that we kind of allow people to even experience this creative asset in the first place uh oh oh I, I i always think about this like open systems if you look at you know the history of computer science open systems win every single time on a long mm. enough time horizon so that i i believe that <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um you know it, it's just like uh it, it's just getting enough momentum that is the hard part and, yeah and but if we can do that you know it, it'll it'll actually have real change plus one and i mean there's a million places that i could go with this i do want to come full circle for a second and kind of take the the last 10 minutes here just to talk about reflections i mean i think that we talked a lot about what you guys are building how you're building it why it's important i'm going to start with with andre with you first and i'm going to come over to you second jack what have you learned from the experiences and the experiments that you've run on chain in the past five years like think about you know, doing the RAC token, think about doing tape, think about all these different things. When you go into building a company in the year 2024, as someone who's had such a long history of building in crypto, what do you feel like are the main things that you've learned that you take into this new approach with how you're building moving forward? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. I think like th there's sort of a lot of smaller lessons along the way. You know, I, it's, it's interesting because I, I feel like I, I almost don't really separate it from my career because it is part of my career. You know, yeah. um, I, I, I sort of think of, let's call it my audience or whatever, as you know, it's layered in the sense that uh, there are people that will do anything I ask them. And I love those people. <laughs> there are people that maybe will jump through a few hoops, you know, to get something. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of people that don't care, mm -hmm. that just want to listen to some music here and there. And, and, and that's fine. And maybe a song meant something to them in college or whatever, you know, I, all of those are valid, you know, all of those experiences are valid. And, and like, I think, um, to sort of contextualize like what we're doing here, I, I think it's a little bit more focused at the top level of that, of, of people that are the most engaged and mm. uh, are, are the most interested. So, you know, I, I, I that that's kind of like, uh, seems to be a good focal point as opposed to, get, cause like, it, it's probably a bit harder to get all those other people, the more casual people to care about something, you know, especially if it's technologically complex or whatever, you know, but if you focus on that, that's that high, that, you know, top one, let's call it 10% even, um, I think that's where you create like sustainable businesses for, for artists. And I, I think that I I've, that's been true for my career as a, as a, uh, as a major label artist, as an independent artist, as a, as an indie artist, you know, I, I've done it all. Like uh, it's, it's been true every step of the way, you know, it's like, th that's like a, a common theme that people say a lot, but it, it really is true. Like, I think, that uh that higher subset that's that's a, a good focal point so so i think like all of these experiments have been you know geared towards that group sp specifically with the token you know we gave it away mm -hmm. to that group basically um you know based on past activity essentially like an airdrop but like a web 2 airdrop uh and and 
you know, so, so that was like a way to sort of bring those people on chain perhaps and get them to try a couple of different things. You know, the vast majority of people didn't, didn't claim their airdrop, you know, cause they were like, you know, what the hell is this? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> which we expected. Um, you know, I, I think like that's like, the, the, those are the people that are, uh, you know, that, that I'm kind of like f- focused on. So, so like, I, I think those, uh, learning to maybe lean into that a bit um i i think it has served me well and, and to not expect the mass audience to come with every step of the way you know um but yeah i, I don't know i feel like there there it's it's a uh, uh there's a there's there's so many different things that i kind of learned along the way but i think that's kind of the main theme is like you know just just focus on that group and and engage with them and and they can sustain you and 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 help you have like kind of a long term you know career hmm. that in in some way like kind of enables the rest of the mass audience to enjoy it in a more accessible way which it kind of feeds into each other you know so that that's kind of how i see it um so i don't know if i have to distill it that's kind of that's that's one thing i've learned same question to you, Jack. I would say, what have you learned from your years of building in crypto and how that's informed what you guys are building with Oscillator? Oh, there's too much there. I'm literally sitting here as Andre speaks and answers this question like, oh, shit. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to what to like really highlight on. But um, I, I recently became a father and like two years ago now almost. And I was speaking with someone much more recently um, someone named Nick, he's building a company called fam, another amazing music project in the web three space, crypto space. And he mentioned something about building for his child. And we're talking about like babies here, like (laughs) our babies will not be using products that we're building for 10 plus years at best. Um, But I, I do think that that is probably like a good summary Hmm. of kind of my takeaway. I mean, there's a lot of good and bad, um, and weird motivations and, and a lot of good intentions that aren't necessarily seen on the surface and people. Um, I think that like <laughs> my, my kind of, if I were to like something about my, my experience goes back to people um, mm-hmm. because I, I just, you see so many stripes in this, this space as well as any space, but over time. Um, and I'm really kind of thinking about systems for our own children and what that looks like. Um, it's hard to know it's hard to know if something's going to be right in a year, but I think it's a lot easier to defend ideas that you know need to exist in some form in 10 or 20. Right. Now, whether or not they happen in a year or five or 10 or 20, um, you know, hopefully sooner than later, but um, stick to your guns, stick to the things that you think the world needs to see, because you can be really off on time, but um, someone will come along and find that and, and they'll recognize that. And I think it'll set you up really well for, whatever the next thing you want to make a bet on is don't sell yourself short. And, um, you know, if you play around in some of the casino games, have fun, but don't get lost in it. This stuff is way more powerful than that. Well said. Yeah, I would definitely echo the 10 year time horizon. It's something I come back to a lot on this podcast, which is that music is really in many ways, shapes and form a 10 year game, whether you're an artist or a founder or whatever it might be, I think you really do need to look at it in that time horizon. And I also really resonate with the focus on, who music is reaching and what it's for, you know, and I think in a world where we focus so widely on the maximum amount of play counts that you can possibly get, being able to bring that back to the value that's unlocked for those people who are the ones that are doing whatever you say blindly and religiously, because they just love your music. I think that there's something so special there. And I think even to just end it on a little bit more of an emotional note, I just want to say that I love and appreciate you guys for just being such an advocate of this intersection. You know, I can openly say that, It's no secret that people don't love music X crypto. And it's no (laughs) secret that there hasn't been anything that has really cracked through and been like seen as globally a big win in the crypto space when it comes to music. It's something that I think all of us are very specifically focused on finding the solutions and finding the things that stick around. So, you know, in closing thoughts here, I just want to say uh, it's been amazing being on this journey with you guys. I'm so happy and excited to see what you guys do next. And I'm glad that we get to take this moment to take a time capsule of what's going to happen before everything else comes out, because optimistically it's going to be a very, very fun next 10 years to come. (laughs) 
Lovely. Thanks, Amen Joe. to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I, I, I just want to sort of add one thing at the, at the end here um, is I think uh, in, in the sea of sort of negativity around crypto and music and, and all that, I, I sort of, I look past all that and just try to focus on like, you know, kind of what Jack was saying is like, are we directionally correct? Yes. Mm. Without a doubt. Like you can't argue with me on this. Like we are in the we're headed in the right direction. Uh, we can argue about the you know how to get there and the different you know if we're doing something wrong or doing this or whatever. But like we are headed in the right direction, and uh, and that's what keeps you know all of us like doing this. You know, so um, whether we get there or not, I, that's that's another story. But like I, I feel good about working on something that I feel like is valuable. You know, that's what it's all for. And for people who are listening to this and want to stay up with the journey, they want to sign the manifesto, where should they head to after this episode ends? Uh, I guess like osc.wtf is our, is our website, but um, also uh, uh, Oscillator Inc. on Twitter, X, and Farcaster Lens, all that fun stuff. So o- OSC on Farcaster. Oh yeah, OSC on, on Farcaster. Right. And, Oscillator Inc. On, um, uh, Oscillator Inc. is the company. We'll be releasing uh, kind of a series of products that play around with with data and aggregate as they relate to specific artists. And then OSC is the protocol to be. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Wow, it's a nice uh, little alpha drop there. And closing thoughts here on the podcast. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. This was amazing, and I'm excited to see what you do next. So we'll have to keep in touch. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks we will. All right, thank guys. You, Cooper. Cheers.